Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture in aircraft flight mechanics. For those of you who have been to my office, you'll know that it's got a great big east facing window, which is why this illumination is really good in here. I've never actually been in my office this time of day because I'm normally teaching, so it's about 5 o'clock p.m. right now and the sun is beating down and this is effectively now just a greenhouse, so it's very warm in here. If I look uncomfortable, it's because I am. Okay, I don't want you guys to think I'm horribly unfit and I can't just take the stress of lecturing. Anyway, uh, where are we up to? So we went through aircraft performance last lecture. We were looking at the variation of aircraft drag in cruise. So let's start writing some of this down. What did we cover? We did the variation of dimensional drag. So we did this versus true airspeed and equivalent airspeed. And for true airspeed, we also looked at the variation with altitude and with aircraft weight. And then we found that equivalent airspeed, we said there was no variation effectively with altitude. So that was really useful for us. We try and think about what, we, what we're doing now and why we're developing these, these drag models. So drag, we mentioned, or I mentioned, is effectively a measure of the thrust required. So again, I'm going to bring in a proper aircraft for the next lecture because it's so terrible having a paper airplane. The thrust required is the force required to overcome longitudinal resistance. So we find that the thrust required is the same as the drag and it will be minimum at VMD. So then if we have a glider or a propeller driven aircraft, it means we can fly the farthest at VMD because the aircraft is not expended, it's effectively not being slowed down by this longitudinal force. Or it's being slowed down as, as little as possible. For turbojet engines for reasons that we're going to discover and for other purposes we often want to take consideration of power rather than drag and the reasons why we want to consider power if we're thinking about how long it takes the aircraft to sink vertically so we have a, this other concept of sink rate so that's effectively what we're doing in a glide so we're converting gravitational potential energy to to forwards to, well to to kinetic energy so if rather than we want to maximize the aircraft range which is the distance we want to go we want to maximize the aircraft endurance then we need to make the aircraft lose energy as efficiently as possible lose energy as as, as little as possible so the measure of energy loss is going to be in joules per second. So that's going to be a measure of watts, which is a measure of power. So we are going to look at aircraft power required. So we're going to look at aircraft power required because this will tell us the amount of work per unit second associated with flying. And what this is going to give us when we've got the minimum power condition, this is going to give us the best endurance. if we're in a glider or a turbo jet, sorry, or it's sorry, or a turbo prop or any other prop for that matter. And then we're actually going to show that VMP also gives us the best range for a turbo jet. Okay? So we need to come up with a measure of power for our aircraft in terms of power required 
to keep us moving forward. Let me just find the right place in my notes so I make sure I'm on the right track. Okay, so pop my phone on silent. I'm being annoyed by telemarketers. So the units of power are going to be force multiplied by velocity for our, well, for our I, I, the power required of moving the aircraft forward. So we'll say the power required is equal to thrust required multiplied by our aircraft forward speed. So we already have an expression for thrust required. This is just our drag. So it's A, V squared plus B multiplied by V to the minus two. And we can remember, of course, it's super easy to remember these. Uh, A is equal to half CD naughts, rho S, and then B is equal to K W squared divided by half rho S. Okay, obviously you were yelling at the video what those were. So we can use this and we can multiply it by V to get our power required expression. So that's going to become A multiplied by V cubed plus B times V to the minus one. So this then gives us two very similar terms here. So we sorry it's not B to the minus one, that's me making a stupid mistake. So I'm thinking about the next step and not thinking about what I'm doing. So it's multiplied by V to the minus one, v times v to the minus one. So we've got two parts to this. As before, we have our profile power. Now this is the power associated with overcoming profile drag. And then we've got induced power. And this is the power associated with the work done to effectively create those wingtip vortex structures. So let's have a think about what this will look like now. We, right before, when we had drag, we had a square term and a term to the minus two. So we had a term that rose with the square and a term that fell with the square. Now we've got something slightly different and I need to have a look at this, check I don't plot it incorrectly, because I'm just gonna draw this out. Do I even do this? Let's have a look if it's in the notes. There we go. Oh, we do do this, yes. So in the notes, there's uh, power required on the performance section. So we can then have a look. It's got the incorrect label on the y-axis. Hopefully that will be fixed by the time you guys review this. So we can have a look at power. And the units of this are gonna be in kilonewtons. And then we can plot this versus true airspeed, which is just our V term. So our profile power rises with the cube so it's going to rise quite quickly quite steeply and then our induced power is going to be less steep and then we're going to see that the total power is going to be something that looks like that okay this isn't necessarily the best numerical drawing but it's showing what i want to show And what we'll find, if we plot where the minimum drag speed is on here, minimum drag speed is at the intersection of those two curves still. And we'll then find that our minimum power speed is slower than this. So we've no longer got the minimum of this curve, of this total curve being at the intersection of the two of them. So we got to work out our expression for minimum power. And just as before, we can use some calculus to work this out. VMP, let's go back. Let's say that power required is equal to A multiplied by V cubed 
plus b multiplied by b to the minus 1. So we do take the derivative of this with respect to velocity. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That took me warrantly long to check that was correct there. Okay, so we've now got uh, 3ab squared minus bv to the minus 2, and this is therefore going to be equal to 0 at bnp. So um, we can then say that 3a multiplied by vnp cubed is equal to b multiplied by v, sorry, that's not cubed, that's squared, multiplied by b vnp to the minus 2. Or v and p to the 4 is equal to b divided by 3a. So v and p is equal to b on 3a to the quarter. So we've got a similar expression. Remember that we had v and d is equal to b on a to the quarter. So we can see that the ratio of these two speeds is going to be constant. B and P divided by V and D is going to be a third to the power of a quarter, so whatever that is. Seventy-six percent. Okay, seventy-five point nine eight. So we've just shown that we've got a different speed whereby the aircraft has the the least power required to make it fly, and this is going to be the speed to give us the best endurance, as long as we've got a glider or if we've got a turboprop or piston prop engine. Okay, so this speed is always going to be slower than the minimum drag speed, and you might think, what time? When do we care about endurance? Uh, surely aircraft are going from A to B. There's often times when certain certain aircraft want to stay on position; they want to loiter. So, for cases of endurance, um, sorry, cases of surveillance, perhaps when an aircraft wants to stay on condition, surveilling uh, surveilling what's going on. Um, often, say if we an aircraft wants to go into a holding pattern to but they can't land yet, they want to maintain fuel it's in their interest not to fly at the minimum drag speed but to fly at the minimum power speed or well, actually they're the other way around for, for uh, jet engines anyway and we're going to discuss those a little bit more so we've got a curve that looks like this this is our drag versus true airspeed now let's just put the notes up as well I'm going to have to switch over to a different tab, annoyingly. Hold on one second. Shows when I'm, I'm nice and prepared for these. So, here we go. If you currently look at what I have in Safari, it will just be showing you me finding images of aircraft. So that's, that's uh, where my backgrounds come from today. I would rather be able to look at the notes. So. Sorry about that guys, that's fine. There we go. So we have the graphs up here showing the effect of minimum power. And I would like you to look at these graphs. Um, again, I've, I've produced these using 
plot Lee or plot L Y. So these graphs are sort of interactive, so you can zoom over and see what happens to each of them. If you choose to run this page, which I'm, which I'm not doing at the moment, if you run this as, as live code, then you'll be able to use those plots and, and mess around with them effectively. So let's not bother with that. We see I obviously paid for a really good hosting service that has lots of bandwidth and enables me to access this perfectly when I'm trying to present. Here we go. So we've got our effectively the graph like this. And remember when we looked at the aircraft drag, we removed this dependency, we can remove this altitude dependency. So that's what's going on here. This graph is obviously not a good one to look at. This is the total drag versus EAS for a bunch of different velocities. So the reason I've plotted like this, we can pretend it's because I want you to be able to show that you've got these these parts up here that you can look at. So you can choose to zoom in, you can choose to auto scale it, or you can choose to zoom in on a certain portion and look at it, okay? So we've got all the different parts we can look at. All of those curves are collapsed onto each other for this one. So we want to do something similar for power now. We want to think about what happens to power. Um, we need to think about what happens in terms of altitude first. So the first thing we're going to look at is how altitude affects minimum power. So let's switch these over. Okay, so the variation of altitude, rather than shifting those curves to the right, which is what happened with the drag speed, so with the, with the drag versus altitude, this is what we see here is these curves are shifted to the right and up. And it's because the V... Um, in the A and the B terms, in A we've got V to the 3 and in B we've got V to the minus 1. So they don't rise and fall at the same rate when we change to the, sorry, when we change altitude effectively. So that one's done there and then we see the aircraft weight. I want you guys to look through these, make sure you understand them and be able to sort of reproduce these plots. So the next step that we took when we had the drag is we said, okay, well, it's not great that we've got all of these different curves. It would be useful if we could plot them all on the same curve. So for drag, the way that we did that, going to want to do something similar with the with the power but it's not going to be quite the same the way that we do it we're going to have to just adjust our methodology just slightly to remove that to remove the altitude dependency so we've got power is equal to a multiplied by v squared plus b multiplied by v to the minus 2 and I'm going to represent this in a slightly different way. If we want to take the V, out, the, that extra V that we include outside of the expressions, we could represent it like this. And then we remember that V is equal to VE multiplied by sigma to the minus a half, which is equal to VE multiplied by the square roots of rho, sea level, divided by rho. So every V we can replace with that. So, and I'm going to write A and B out in full as well. So we remember that A is a half CD naught rho S. And then where we had V, I can replace this with VE squared multiplied by rho C level divided by rho. We're going to do the same for the second term. B is K W squared divided by a half rho S multiplied by V, so it's VE to the minus 2, and then we're going to have rho divided by rho C level. And then outside of here we had this extra V term here. So we have VE multiplied by rho C level on rho, all square rooted. 
In fact, let's uh, rather than writing that, let's write down sigma to the minus a half because it's just going to be easier to represent it like that. So we'll say outside here we've got sigma to the minus half on this side. So as before, these cancel, these cancel, and we end up with the power required is equal to a e b e squared plus b e multiplied by v e to the minus 2 multiplied by v e sigma to the minus half. So we've got this extra sigma on the right hand side. So sigma remember is defined as rho divided by rho sea level so we haven't removed the altitude dependency yet for our power required. If instead though we say, well, we'll just take this and we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by sigma to the half, we end up with this expression PR multiplied by sigma to the half is equal to A E B E cubed plus B E multiplied by V E to the minus one. So we've got sort of this other quantity here. Now I've never found a name for what this is called in any of the textbooks. I just see it plotted and called something. So I call this density scale power. And then if we plot density scale power versus equivalent airspeed, All of our power required curves will fall, and imagining that I was a good enough drawer for all of these to fall on top of each other, we'd have h equals zero, h equals 10 kilometers, h equal to 50 kilometers. So they would all collapse on top of each other. Again, imagine that I was an excellent drawer and these all fell perfectly on top of each other. Okay. So the salient part here is that we can remove the altitude dependency by using equivalent airspeed again, but we are not plotting required power. We're plotting instead this density scaled required power. So why, why have we been doing any of this? Why have we been doing this drag model and this, this thrust model? Why have we, why have we got them? Well, The thrust or the power sets the power plant requirements for our aircraft. So in order to maintain a certain flight speed, in order to maintain a certain forward speed, we then know that there's a certain amount of thrust required or a certain amount of power required. So that tells us how big our engine would have to be to maintain a certain speed. More often it's calculated the other way around, so we have, a, we have an engine that's capable of producing either a certain amount of thrust or a certain amount of power that's constant with forward speed. And for those conditions we can then determine what the maximum and what the minimum flight speeds are. So we'll say first off, consider an engine capable of providing a constant thrust and we're going to call this the thrust available okay, and this is going to be T A so if we have graph of thrust versus equivalent airspeed. We can plot our thrust required and then we'll have a thrust available constant line because again this is producing a constant thrust and I'm going to fill in brackets here with forward speed. So this then tells us 
the range of available flight speeds at a given altitude or for a given condition. So this intersects the graph at two points, V1 and V2. That's right here, this is my TA. So the intersection of TR and TA shows two possible flight speeds. And again, for this aircraft, we're doing it in EAS. So it shows two possible flight speeds for a given thrust value. And how are we going to determine what they are? Well, this is just a quadratic equation because our TR is equal to A multiplied by V squared plus B multiplied by V to the minus two. And this has to be equal to our thrust available value. Now for this, this is just a constant. So this is a quadratic equation, it doesn't look like a traditional one yet. So we're going to multiply this whole thing by V squared. And what we get, we get A multiplied by V to the four minus TA multiplied by V squared plus B multiplied by what would be V to the naught, so let's get rid of the multiplication, is equal to zero. So this is a quadratic equation in V squared. So we could rewrite this as lowercase a, just to not avoid confusion, a V squared squared minus B V squared plus C is equal to zero. So our, for the quadratic expression, we've got A is equal to A, B is equal to, there should be a plus, plus there, is equal to minus TA, and C is equal to B. So these lower cases are just our quadratic coefficients. And then what we end up with, we can use the quadratic formula to get our expression for V coming out of this. So we remember the quadratic formula it will be V squared, because remember this is a quadratic in V squared, and we minus B plus or minus square root of V squared minus 4AC all on 2A. So for us, we can just write this down in terms of this expression that we actually care about. So what we're going to have is thrust available plus or minus the square root of TA squared minus 4AB divided by 2A. And so our V is going to be equal to the square root of this. So it's going to give us two values. And that will give us V1 and V2, which are the two possible flight speeds here. So for an aircraft, for which we know A is equal to half CD naught row S and B is equal to K W squared on half row S. Then we can determine the answer. So for which we know those and also a fixed thrust available 
we can then determine the two flight speeds that are possible for that aircraft. So the two flight speeds possible for steady cruise. So this seems a little bit counterintuitive perhaps because we've got this concept that if we have our aircraft and we've got thrust required, thrust available, there's two airspeeds we can fly at. Okay, one's fast, one's slow, and they are going to be either side of B and D, B1 and B2. If we're sat anywhere else on this curve, if we're sat, damn, let's do that in another color. If we're flying at any speed between those two, the power plant is producing more thrust than it requires to overcome drag. So if B is greater than, no, I've drawn it the wrong way around. If B is greater than B1 and less than B2, then what we have there is that our thrust available is greater than our thrust required, in which case the aircraft accelerates. So the aircraft speeds up. And then conversely, if we're up here, or if we're up here, in this case, if V is greater than V2, or if V is less than V1, then our thrust required is greater than our thrust available. And in that case, aircraft slows down. Now we're just considering a constant thrust at the moment we're not thinking about the pilot being able to adjust it with the throttle and we're going to get to that a little bit maybe i want you to think about the connotations of what's going on here and we're going to think about what happens if we sit at either v1 or v2 so our pilot can sit in the aircraft and for a given constant thrust say 25 kilonewtons of thrust there are two speeds that are possible to fly without speeding up or slowing down and those are v1 and v2 so let's think about what happens when we're sat at either of those and we're going to look at speed stability So if our pilot has trimmed the aircraft at V1, TA, the thrust available, is set, and it's constant at that value. So this then corresponds to this flight speed, V1. Now if something happens, if there's a gust of velocity perturbation, let's think about what happens if there's a sudden tailwind gust that moves the aircraft from V1 to this position. So in that case, what's happened is that we've got this value now for our thrust required. Our thrust available is higher than it, so we've suddenly got positive excess thrust. So our aircraft is going to want to speed up, which means the aircraft is going to speed up, and speed up, and speed up until it reaches this position here. 
until it's found a stable position. What would be more likely to happen is the pilot would adjust it, but if, there were, if it wasn't adjusted by the pilot, then it would speed up and it would speed up and it would speed up. Same thing happens if the aircraft has a negative velocity perturbation. If the aircraft slows down for any reason, there's now this negative excess thrust. And what that means is that the thrust required is now greater than the thrust available. And if, if the thrust required, i.e. the drag is greater than the thrust available, the aircraft is going to slow down. And in this case, the aircraft will slow down until it reaches the stall speed, in which case it will stall and fall out of the sky. Obviously, the pilot would adjust those things before they happen. But what this means is, is that this position is unstable. So if it's unstable in terms of cruise speed, it doesn't mean that we can't fly there, it just means there's constant workload. The pilot's going to have to constantly be adjusting the stick and the throttle to maintain that flight speed. By contrast, if the aircraft is trimmed at this flight speed, if we have a gust that pushes the aircraft up to this speed up here, so it's accelerated, there's then negative excess thrust, the aircraft will have a tendency to slow down and it will reach that equilibrium position again. Same thing if the aircraft slows down to here, it then has more thrust available than the thrust required, so it will have a tendency to return to that position. So flight here is stable in terms of cruise speed. And this is good because it's less workload, means pilot can sit back, drink coffee, not focus on doing what they're doing. Obviously I'm being joking. It's, it's ideal to want to have a pilot that's not fatigued. Okay, so effectively this is the preferable position to fly at. So what we've just shown here is that for a given thrust available, a given set thrust, there are two possible cruise speeds. We'll say V1 and V2. And we're going to say here that V1 is less than the minimum drag speed and V2 is greater than the minimum drag speed. This one, V1 is unstable. And V2 is stable. So it's preferable to fly at the faster condition there. Now, in this bit of work we've just done, so we started up here and we said consider, consider an engine capable of producing a constant thrust. And then we looked and we said there were two flight speeds we could fly at then for a given constant thrust. We need to, firstly, before, before we go ahead, we can realize there is a variation in thrust that, that can be done. So to fly at any of the speeds, say in this part here, the pilot would reduce the throttle. So if the pilot wanted to fly at, say, this speed here, they would reduce the throttle. Okay, so that's reducing the amount of available thrust. Okay, we're not going to look at really doing any throttle application in this work because what we're looking at, we want to look at how thrust varies, not with pilot inputs, but we're going to look at how it varies because of altitude. So we won't look at throttle setting. And I should probably say in the preceding, we did everything in terms of thrust. So we said we took thrust available curve, intersected it with the thrust sorry, intersected with the thrust required curve, we came up with those two airspeeds. Now, it would be very 
similar if we had an engine capable of producing constant power. Then for that case, we just look at the power required curve, which is the A multiplied by B to the three, plus B multiplied by V to the minus one. Okay, so I'm gonna do the following, assuming that we're just looking at thrust uh, engines with constant thrust, but all of the analysis is the same that we will perform for an engine that produces constant power. So for any air breathing engine, which is any engine on any aircraft that you ever like to fly on, well, within the lifetime of aircraft that I can think ahead of, remembering that I'm turning into an old man, the engines produce thrust by taking air and pushing it out. So there's two considerations there. Jet engines are air breathing in that they require air to produce the thrust itself and they're also going to have a dependency on the thrust produced by the amount of air that's available. Um, very similar for pit for reciprocating engines as well. Those will have a um, those will have a variation based upon the density of the atmospheric properties. We have we've looked at the atmosphere and we've looked at the variation of density. We haven't actually looked at the variation of density. We looked at the variation of sigma which is uh, effectively the density ratio. And we saw that density sort of fell off in this parabola shape. So it makes sense that engine performance is a function of altitude. And we would expect that when the air is thinner, when the density is lower, those engines aren't going to be as good. Now, actually, it's a whole, whole load more complicated than that. So there's a section in the notes where I direct you to look at some proper notes, basically, or look at it. I direct you to a good textbook. So there's a part on aircraft flight mechanics, steady level flight, called the thrust and power model. And I direct you guys to chapter three of aircraft performance and design by John Anderson. Feel free to have a look at that. It's not required for this course, but it will just explain to you the validity of what we're looking at. So before we go ahead, we're going to broadly break down engines into two types. We're going to have thrust engines. And we're going to have power engines. Thrust engines produce thrust, constant with forward speed. Power engines, you probably guess, produce power, but it's constant with forward speed. Now this is a big, sim well, not, it's not a big simplification. It, it works to enable us to use these equations moving forward. If you look at that chapter in Anderson, you'll see that for certain aircraft types, it is a reasonable assumption to make that we can have a thrust that's relatively constant with forward speed Whereas in reality, it's actually a function of temperature, Mach number, and all other things. Um, but for our purposes, we're using this as a model to help us understand aircraft performance, and it's typically used at this stage of aircraft design. So our thrust engines, these are going to be pure jet engines and low bypass ratio turbofans. And then our power engines are going to be propellers and high bypass ratio turbofans. So we're going to use a model for these engines that helps us understand what's able to be produced by them. So for a thrust engine, we say that the maximum thrust it can produce is TSL, and that is the sea level thrust. And then for a power engine, imaginatively, it's called PSL for sea level power. And the model that we're going to use for both of these is very similar, and this is a bit of an adaptation of of what's effectively in 
Anderson based upon a collection of other notes that I've pulled together. So we're going to say that our thrust at some altitude divided by our thrust at sea level is going to be equal to k multiplied by sigma to the power of n. And the same our power at some altitude is equal to the power available at sea level multiplied by k multiplied by sigma to the n. So sigma we know is equal to the density ratio. The other things we don't know, k, this is nice and easy, this is the throttle setting. Now, I said we wouldn't really deal with throttle, but I'm going to include it in here for now because I might introduce some questions later about the throttle. I don't know. It's just going to be effectively what throttle setting would you need to be at to get a certain flight speed. So the throttle setting for our purposes is a number anywhere from zero to one. One's full throttle, zero is not on at all. Okay? And then N is a parameter that dictates this engine variation with things like temperature, how efficient the engine is, and altitude. So N is equal to one unless you're told otherwise. And then we've got the exact same things on the right hand side, so I don't need to actually annotate that. This is slightly different to what I had in the, in the PDF notes. I did have in the notes, so let's put this. We had, I think the N was 0.7 up to 11 kilometers. And then 1.0 after 11 kilometers. Now, that's an attempt to take into account the variation of temperature with altitude past the proper pause. We're not gonna use that here, okay? Because it just complexifies things and I could never find a good site for that anyway. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna use that, that particular model. It's not widely used. So we're gonna use these models here and these are gonna help us determine what the thrust and the power are with altitude. So we already looked at what sigma looks like with altitude, so this is say h, and we've got sigma. At sea level, it's one, and it falls down rapidly with altitude. So this tells us that for both of our engine types, it's met the requirement that we said it would do, which is thrust and power fall with altitude. So in the following, we're going to assume we've got full throttle available for all of these. We're going to have a look at what happens. Now I'm going to do the following for thrust, and it's the exact same procedure that would happen for power engines. So this is why it was helpful to have a single drag curve with altitude because what we're going to want to do is we're going to take our drag and we're going to put the total let's see our drag um let's sorry let's call this thrust thrust required or thrust available which is thrust required is drag anyway if we were plotting this versus forward speed true airspeed we'd have say one of these for sea level We'd have one of these for the first altitude, one of these for the next altitude, one of them for the next altitude. And this would get messy if we were doing this graph. So we're going to plot these versus equivalent airspeed. And this gives us, let's draw a nice big curve. This is our thrust required. If we then plot the sea level value on here, thrust available at sea level gives me v1 and v2 okay and we can work those out because we've got the quadratic equation we could work out what those values are if we then say at five kilometers we work out the next value we can see that our v1 and v2 are getting closer together so v1 increases v2 
decreases. So our range of speeds is reduced in both directions as altitude increases. And T, this could be 10 kilometers. This is gonna continue and our two flight speeds are gonna get closer and closer together until one point at which, let's draw this as a thinner line. And imagine I'd drawn that perfectly. This will reach one point where the graphs intersect at our minimum drag speed. And let's say this is the thrust available at H seal, which is short for ceiling. So let's just summarize what's happened here. As altitude increases, the thrust available reduces. So V1 increases, V2 falls. So the range of flight speeds is reduced until finally at one single altitude, at some altitude, T, which we know is equal to T sea level multiplied by sigma, and we're just gonna say sigma to the N, you can use N is equal to one, is equal to our minimum drag. And remember, if you want to know what minimum drag is, then we know that V and D is equal to B on A to the quarter, and then D min is gonna be equal to A B and D squared plus B B and D to the minus two. So we've then got some altitude that our thrust available can only intersect with the curb at the minimum drag speed. So at some altitude, there is a single possible flight speed. So at this altitude, we've def well we've defined what's called the absolute ceiling of the aircraft. absolute ceiling of the aircraft means that there isn't enough thrust or power available remembering that we could do all of this analysis with power as well there isn't enough of that to fly any higher basically because as we as we would go higher then what we would see that if our thrust available this would be thrust h greater than h seal if miraculously our aircraft was to exist at that condition it would be it would require more thrust than it is actually capable of producing, so the aircraft would slow down. Okay, so that's the absolute ceiling of the aircraft. Now, hopefully, you'll see why that's a maybe slightly worrying concept. Not worrying, but just a tenuous concept related to what we looked at in this speed stability. So, flight obviously can't be maintained at the absolute ceiling. Flight, so we'll say, we'll say sustained cruise is not maintainable here. So sustained cruise is not maintainable at the absolute ceiling. So we introduce something else called the service ceiling. service ceiling is where a small rate of climb is still available and we haven't covered climb yet but the way we introduce these concepts we introduce things and we're going to come back and do some of the physics
the small rate of climb is then, sorry, the small rate of climb is determined by the airframer. So as I'm doing that, as I'm writing it down, I think, hey, that's a really good question for you guys. So as we're going through this module, I'm thinking about how I can ask you to do these assignments at home. Now that's quite a tricky question to determine, um, to determine the service ceiling of an aircraft, because I couldn't really ask that in a formal examination, because it would be relatively difficult to do by hand in addition with going through everything else. But we're going to go through climb in a little bit and I am probably going to ask that as a question of you guys. I might think about how I'm going to phrase that. Um, but yeah, we're going to just pay attention to that, make sure you can sort of understand where that's coming from. Um, yeah, we're going to go through that more, I think. So we've got this variation of these speeds with altitude. If we look here, so at going back to our thrust required and thrust available curves, those V1s and V2s get closer and closer together. So let's go to the notes and just show. In the notes, I've gone through and I've done this for you effectively. So this is again using Plotly, so you can click on here, you can zoom in, you can pan around, auto scale, have a look. There's something interesting on here that I didn't speak about yet. So let's, um, let's talk about that. Let's uh, auto scale. Okay, so I've introduced the stall speed on here. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, let's talk about this here. So on our aircraft, we can determine those speeds V1 and V2. One of the very first things that we worked out how to determine for our aircraft was the stall speed. So we might find that our aircraft, say, has a stall speed here. And remember, that's VE stall is equal to square root of the weight divided by a half row, half row sea level multiplied by S multiplied by CL max. Okay, so you can determine this for an aircraft as long as you know CL max. If you produce this graph below, you already know the weight and you already know the wing area because you need those for A and B. So what this is telling us is that for this particular aircraft that I've just made up and we plotted here, is that for these speeds here, i.e. for altitudes whereby V1 is less than the stall speed, the minimum speed is the stall speed. Sorry, so we'll say for aircraft and altitudes where V1 is less than V stall, flight's obviously not possible at those speeds. So we need to know that the lowest speed possible is the stall speed. Similarly, if I'd drawn this slightly better, let's, um, let's draw another graph here. So we've got an aircraft with a thrust required curve that looks like this. And then I've got different altitudes. So we've got increasing H. And say our stall speed is here on this given aircraft. What this means is that for altitudes that are above or altitudes where V1 is above this where v1 is greater than v stall it's certainly possible to stall the aircraft at these altitudes it just means that if the aircraft is taken to cl max it's already in a condition where the thrust required is greater than the thrust available so the aircraft would be slowing down and would be losing altitude at these speeds anyway so stall is possible but v1 is min cruise speed.
So looking at this graph here, if we take all these values off our V1, V2, V1 and V2, V1 and V2 at all these different altitudes, we could then plot V1 and V2 versus altitude. Okay, so let's go back to notes. So here, this is the thrust required and then the thrust available at different altitudes with some horrible decimal places here, clearly showing that the absolute ceiling of this aircraft is at 9.9 .9 kilometers. I should probably reduce the number of decimal places there. The code to produce this is sort of long, it's not too bad. A lot of this is just annotating the graph, okay? The code to produce this is a sort of one equation that produces this, and then there's one equation that produces the thrust available as well, it just increases with altitude. And the stall speed again is a single equation. So have a look through this and check if you can understand it. What we can do then, for each of those intersections which we get out, we can then plot the variation of velocity versus um, the altitude. So we've got our maximum and minimum. So this one up here says that for our equivalent airspeed at an altitude of six kilometers, or just about six kilometers, our minimum speed possible is 55.76 meters per second. And over here, 156 meters per second. If we look at the true airspeed, we see what we would expect to see is the true airspeed is higher. Remembering that in our radical sign, I'm going to try and do this. I think I'm reverse. No, this way. Yeah. Okay. So our radical sign, true airspeed is highest. So that has to be larger in all of these. What this doesn't account for is that for this graph, at altitudes of about six kilometers and lower, the aircraft is actually stall limited. So if we include this in here, we get this sort of graph out instead, okay? So the source code for this one is not available easily. You can't click and include it. I'd like you guys to be able to reproduce this sort of graph, okay? So this is going to be important. You could, if you want to click on here and look at, or look at the, download the source, but I promise you, if you just take code and just copy it, you're never gonna learn anything. I'd like you to figure them out a little bit, okay? So that's as much as we're going to go through in this lecture. I think we've covered a lot today. Let's just have a recap of what we've covered. Let's go through. So we started out looking at, let's make sure this is visible. Started out looking at the variation, well I said we looked at drag and then we said drag was all well and good but sometimes we want to think about power. Power is important when we need to think about energy. So energy is useful when we want to think about making sure the aircraft has the slowest sink rate. So we came up with our power expression, which is just multiplying drag by velocity again. And then this introduced a set of curves, very similar looking to the drag curves, but we found that our minimum power is actually slower than our minimum drag speed. It's about 75% of it. And we showed that using some simple maths, which is good. So we showed that here, 76%. Okay, and we showed the minimum power speed is this value here. So make sure you guys are comfortable with that. Um, we then said, okay, well, for drag, we know that our drag available varies with altitude. It shifts all those curves to the right. For the power available, it shifts those curves to the right and up with altitude. So it would be useful to remove the altitude dependency. And it's slightly more complicated to do that for power, just the fact that we have this extra term in here. So we've got density scale power. Once we'd done that, we said, well, why, why on earth are we doing this? And then we said, well, it's because engines can produce either thrust or power that's constant, which is a bit of a stretch. But the intersection of that thrust or power available curve and the thrust or power required curve gives us two speeds that are possible, one of which is unstable and one of which is stable. So the one that's faster than the minimum drag speed is the stable speed. Okay, so we showed this was just a quadratic problem to solve. Going through, talked about that speed stability. Bob's your uncle. Then we introduced this idea. We said, okay, we, we want to look at the variation of thrust and power with altitude because for air breathing engines, it makes sense that it's gonna be a function of that. Introduced two models where we have both of them represent the thrust or the power as a ratio, or sorry, as a effectively a, something smaller than the maximum thrust we can produce, which is the sea level value. 
Okay, so n, you'll be told what that is. It's probably going to be one for a lot of things. I might change it on some of your homeworks just to um, keep you on your toes. And that gives us the variation of the thrust and power for with altitude. And then we said, okay, well now we've got this variation with altitude, we can overlay thrust available and thrust required to determine the maximum and the minimum speeds, V1 and V2, and how they vary with altitude, bearing in mind that at certain altitudes, the minimum isn't V1, the minimum is the stall speed. So we went through, looked at those, and then we said that there's something at the very top where we can only cruise at one possible speed, which is VMD, and that is the absolute ceiling. Clearly that's not possible, so we then said, okay, well, we'll introduce this idea called service ceiling, which I sort of a bit hand waverly said, a small rate of climb is possible. And we haven't discussed that yet because we haven't gone through climb. We will go through climb, and you guys are gonna be determining something around that, okay? So that's it for today. That's been a lot we've gone through, um, and by that's it for today, it's that it for this lecture, and it's also this it for me recording today. So I'll hopefully be wearing some different clothes next time you see me. Hope you're all enjoying things. I hope uh, you are keeping on track with the lectures as we're going along. I hope you guys are finding these useful. Make sure to put questions onto Slack. Make sure to put questions um, in public areas if you can, that's great. And remember, if you can name any of those aircraft that I'm using that aren't ridiculously obvious, that would be amazing. Take care, guys.